all across America and around the world. This is Veterans Radio. This is Veterans Radio. Welcome to Veterans Radio. I am Jim Fossone. I'm the officer of the deck today. We've got some great programs for you. I think you'll find very interesting. We always want to remind you, you can find more about Veterans Radio at its Facebook site or at the web. VeteransRadio.org is our new URL, VeteransRadio.org. Where we're on the web 24-7, you can find a lot of our podcasts there as well. We post new ones every Tuesday, so you can get a new story, a new interview, something you didn't know before by going to veteransradio.org. And before we get started, we want to thank our sponsors. First up, we want to thank National Veteran Business Development Council, nvbdc.org. It was established to certify both service-disabled and veteran-owned businesses. You'll find out how they can help your business by going to nvbdc.org. We want to thank Legal Help for Veterans. Legal Help for Veterans fights for veterans' disability rights all across the nation. You can reach them at 800-693-4800 or on the web at LegalHelpForVeterans.com. We want to welcome to Veterans Radio today Michael Plunkett. He is a uh, Marine. Uh, we're going to talk about his service and we're going to talk about an endeavor that he's involved in called Literature of War Foundation. Michael, welcome to Veterans Radio. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, This is a topic we've talked, uh, touched on a few times, and that is military service does give some guys uh, and gals an opportunity to read some literature that they didn't do in high school or college. Uh, And and, uh, so this is is an uh, area of interest to me. But before we get there, tell us how a nice uh, kid from Long Island ended up in the Marine Reserves. Yeah, of course. Kind of, I, I did a lot of things a little bit out of order in my life. Uh, graduated high school, 18 years old. I told my parents I want to join the Marine Corps, uh, and they were like, "Absolutely not. We want you to go to college." Uh, so I looked around, didn't really like what I was seeing too much, but I applied to Gettysburg College because I was a big Civil War guy, and I said, "If I don't get in here, I'm joining the Marine Corps." And uh, I got in, which looking back on it, that would have been 2009. I think my life would have been a lot different if I had not gotten into the, to Gettysburg, but I did. I went, I took a look at ROTC, decided it wasn't really for me, and you know, kind of had four years of college, beautiful time, really enjoyed myself. Got out, I was an English teacher for uh, a hot minute, and then, uh, I don't know, the, the desire never left me. So I ended up bumping into a family friend who he had just gotten back from a deployment as a, as a reservist in the Marine Corps. And he was telling me all about it. And, uh, you know, like I said, the desire just never left me. So uh, I put my, my papers into my teaching job. And June 6th, I left for Paris Island to go be uh, to become a machine gunner. You know, they, they tried talking me into looking at becoming an officer. And I just, uh, I don't know, I, I, I envisioned being an enlisted Marine. That, that always appealed to me. The, specifically, the infantry was something that I thought was, uh, it had a, a certain appeal to me. And uh, I went for it. It doesn't sound like that came out of uh, sort of a family history of military service, though. Well, actually, it's funny you mentioned that. I, the reason I, I, I picked the Marine Corps is because of my grandfather. He, he served in the, in the Marines early in Korea. Uh, he was actually at Incheon. He was on the streets of Seoul, and then he was up at the Chosen Reservoir when the, uh, when the Chinese came in. So I kinda, he didn't speak about it that much. He was a 19-year-old kid when he went through that experience, but... He was a rifleman, you know, and he, towards the end of his life, he kind of opened up about it. So I, I grew up hearing about the stories of, uh, you know, what it was like to serve in the in the Chosen Reservoir and, and, and being surrounded by the Chinese and all that. Not that he didn't really, like, idealize it. He didn't romanticize it, but that was his, his lived experience, you know. So I, I definitely internalized some of that as a youngster. And as I got older, it stayed stayed relevant to me. Well, it's that's interesting because the uh, those – those Marines, those young Marines, the, the the frozen chosen, wow! What they went through is uh, is really quite incredible, and so many people have forgotten yeah. about the Korean War and what all those uh, guys went through. 
against the communist is uh, is is something that we should not forget about. So that sort of planted a seed, but I'm wondering whether or not that maybe was also the seed for your uh, going to school, becoming an English teacher, moving on to be a a, a a writer. You have a master's in creative writing from the College of Charleston, in South Carolina. Is is where where did the writing bug come from? Well, you know, it's a, it's a great question. Writing and and more more so storytelling has always been a big part of my. Uh, the way I communicate with people is the way that my family communicates. You know, my grandmother, uh, some of my, my most clear childhood memories are the stories that my grandmother would tell me at the Christmas party or when we would go out to visit her over on summer vacations. And, you know, that's the way we, we, we transfer our history from one generation to the next, you know, and I, I don't mean to make it too serious. I mean, most of these stories were very, very funny, but she had a way of just making it so interesting, you know, everything from her parents to like, honestly, like most of my, my grandfather's Marine Corps stories came through her because he told all of them to her when they were younger. And even though he was part of that generation that didn't talk about it that much, my grandmother talked about everything. You know, she could, uh, she could make a, a monk talk. And so she, <laughs> she would re- relay these kind of stories to me. And that always stuck with me. So, you know, when I was a typical, you know, writer kind of kid story, I, like when, even when I was in elementary school, the, you, you give me a, a paper and pen, I would be scribbling away, writing all sorts of stories that came into my head. And that just never really left. Right. So, you know, when I, when I ended up going to get my master's in creative writing, it it was one of these, you know, at that point I was the reservist. I was doing my once a month drill weekends and I'd actually switched over to working in finance and I hated it. I was really miserable. And the whole time I had, I kept writing, you know, I'd finished an entire novel in the odd hours early in the morning, late at night. And this was a, you know, I, I was finally like, you know what, like, it's time to either do this or don't do it. I'm going to take the next step. And for me, that was getting a, a creative writing degree. Well, you know, I normally joke when I talk to my uh, Marine interviews here about uh, how a Marine thought they could write something with crayons. But obviously, you were a writer before you became a Marine. So I think that gives you a pass. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so let's turn to uh, this idea of the Literature of War Foundation that you started with um, an active duty Marine Lieutenant Colonel that you should talk about. Um, of course. But, but uh, get us started. How did this happen? Yeah, so Lieutenant Colonel Tom Schumann, a good friend of mine, he had served, uh, he had taken an appointment as, a, as an English professor at the Naval Academy a couple of years ago. Uh, he, he's kind of a, a unicorn in the Marine Corps. He, he has done quite a few different billets. He's had some interesting experiences. And kind of on a whim, he had applied to get a, a graduate degree uh, through the Marine Corps. They were offering a special like English degree program. And he was able to, to, to get that degree. And then he, because of that, he was offered this appointment at the Naval Academy. And he spent a semester or excuse me, a year teaching there. And those experiences had a, had a profound impact on him. He was, he was working with these young cadets and they were, you know, talking about literature, specifically war literature. And he started this Instagram account called Literature of War, or Lit of War uh, for short. And he was just posting quotes. It's a little red square with quotes from some texts that that, uh, had an impact on him, and it took off, right? And that's where he pulled me in, and he said, you know, he's still an active duty Marine, so he had active duty Marine things to do, and he's like, I can't be hanging out on Instagram all day, so why don't you take this over? And it's, it continued to grow, and we ended up incorporating as a 501c, 501c3 nonprofit, right, through the IRS, with the idea of how do we take this to the next level, right? Like, how do we have immediate impact on our active duty serving men and women? And all branches, like, what is the best way to do that through literature? Uh, we did some book drives. Uh, we've done, you know, a couple little things like that, but... When we did our book drives, we, we sent a lot of probably around 400 books out to various active duty units. And it was great, except we don't know what happened to the books after after they were received. You know what I mean? Like we don't know if they're in a library somewhere or are they shoved in a, in a closet. We don't know. So we had to go back to the drawing board. And what we came up with is a book club, right? Like a book club is you sitting down with the with your teammates with the people in your platoon with your friends and you're you're reading the same text together right and this came about because a a pretty motivated staff sergeant reached out to me a marine corps staff sergeant part of an artillery battery 
and he said, I want to do a specific book with my, with my platoon. I want, he wanted to do Matterhorn by Carl Barlantis. And he's like, can you send me just this book instead of like a whole bunch of random books? And at first I was like, ah, it's not really the way we work. But the more I thought about it, I was like, that's actually a really good idea. So I said, how about this? We'll get you 25 copies. We'll get you some notebooks. We'll get you some merchandise from a, like, you know, with our logo on it and everything. You guys do the book club on your own and then we'll meet up with you and we'll talk about what the experience was like. And that, uh, that created our, our platoon book club initiative, which has been going for four or five months now and, and doing pretty cool things within the community. Well, it's a really interesting idea because it's a military book club, right? It, it's a pl- right. Pl- uh, You're operating it here at the platoon level, but it could be shipboard. It could be a department. Now, we all probably have heard about, you know, these uh, three and four star generals and admirals who have a list of books they, they recommend you read. Right. How how is what you're doing different than that? Right. That's a great question. I mean, those lists are essential, right? That those started coming about in the last couple of decades, and they they definitely serve a need. Where we see that we separate ourselves is we're coming at it sort of from outside the community a little bit. Like I'm no, I, you know, I'm out of the Marine Corps. I've got uh, maybe a different perspective. Uh, you know, I'm coming from more of an enlisted background, right? Like. Uh, a lot of those, the Commandant's reading list, it's coming from a more top to bottom. I like to see this as stuff that maybe these guys wouldn't have been exposed to uh, if they hadn't partaken in this in this program. You know, it's literature they might not have ever even considered reading if they hadn't gone through this program. You know, we try and meet the needs of the unit. We also ask, like, what do you want to read? Right. So we will take that suggestion as long as it has literary merit. And we think it's they have a reason for wanting to read it. It's not just some random book, but something that. Uh, can help them bond as a, as a platoon. We, we're, we're okay with that. And uh, we also have a curated list. And these are authors that have either done some work recently or ancient classics that we think are of value to the community. So in that way, we're looking to support, like, like tell us what you need, as well as, like, here's a curated list if you, if you are looking for something to choose from. It really sounds a little less stuffy to me, if you will. <laughs> That's those are your words, not mine. Okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> you don't want to get in trouble with the generals. I get it. I you know I don't I don't care. But it it, it as you say, you're coming to meet the unit, the platoon, the 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 department where it's at. Something right. they're interested in reading, so it's uh, kind of ground up rather than top down, isn't it? Yes, exactly. And the idea here is that it's it's not just explicitly military fiction all the time or military poems or it can be about stuff that at first glance you might think like i don't see how this relates to the military or my experience in the military but then once you if you sit there and you read it you're going to start to see that like these experiences that we're listing there are not exactly uh they're, they're not too far removed than what you're going through maybe it's a different time period maybe it's a maybe it's not exactly a war but there's something you can get out of there that you can relate to your own experience in serving in the military well, the word literature is going to scare some folks off. They're going to go, eh, hey, you know, I'm not reading the, the classics. I'm not reading the Greek and Roman classics here. So give us, right. help us understand what you're talking about uh, in terms of books that have literary merit. Give, it, give us some examples of what's on your curated list. Yeah, of course. We've got, uh, for instance, we just did our first actual debrief session where once the platoon reads their book, right, they, they get a chance to sit with us on Zoom. Because keep in mind, these units, they're, they're coming and going. Some of them are halfway across the world. So we sit down on Zoom and we say, like, what do you think of the book? How was the experience? What did you learn from, from bonding? And, like, we just did our first one with uh, Gates of Fire by Stephen Pressfield, which is a novel that came out a couple of decades ago. And it's it's about the Spartan 300, right? It's about the, the famous sure. battle where they, where they faced off against uh, insurmountable odds. You know, they were completely outnumbered and, and they held against them for, for a prolonged period of time. Now, these were probably 19, 20, 21 year old infantry Marines in Okinawa. And they were looking at this and so it was interesting. The, the group was a little divided, right? Some of them were like, this was amazing. I, I, there's a lot of action in it, right? There's a lot of combat, ancient combat. While like the other half of the room was like, this has no bearing on anything I'm doing here. Like I'm serving in the 21st century Marine Corps. And it was interesting to see the division there because in my mind, it's like the, one of the guys said, you know, there's a scene where this one character, he's basically standing in a, in a, in a field being rained on. And he's, he's looking up at the gods kind of like contemplating his, his, 
you know, his fortune to be sitting here in this kind of uncomfortable, unpleasant situation. I'm like, that's relatable regardless of what time period you're serving in the, in the military. It doesn't matter if you're serving today or a couple of thousand years ago, you can relate to that experience of being uncomfortable and being like out of your comfort zone uh, in, the, in the elements, right? So, And, and so look into the God, whoever that is for you and saying, what the hell am I doing here? Exactly. And that, and that, I think that's a perfect example of how it's like, okay, so what, that, that's an example of empathy, right? Like when you can suddenly bridge that connection between your situation, and yes, it's a fictional character, but it's based on a real occurrence, right? The Spartan 300 were a real, a real historical event. Stephen Pressfield just turns it into historical fiction, right? He adds drama. Uh, you're, you're bridging a connection there. And I think that's the power. One of the thing, one of the great things about fiction is like, you can take yourself out of your mind a little bit. You can realize I'm not the only person who's been through this situation before. This is something that's a tried and true experience of, you know, in this particular example, the infantrymen, the, 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 the boots on the ground. What would give, give me maybe a more recent example that's on your curated list that, you know, was, was uh, written about maybe more modern times? Yeah, of course. We've got uh, the Fifth Act was on there by Elliot Ackerman, who is a Marine Corps veteran as well. He, had, he served, he's decorated. He's a good friend of mine, and he's written quite a quite a wide variety of books. He's written fiction. He's written kind of thrillers. He's written more literary stuff. He's all, but this book, The Fifth Act, uh, was written very quickly. Uh, it's kind of like sp- sprung from an essay that he was starting at the time when Afghanistan was uh, at the fall of Kabul, right? So he had served. He had emotions about that experience, and he started writing it out, as writers do, and then the situation got exasperated. We all know what was happening at that point. Everybody was trying to get out of there. We had the bombing at the Abbey Gate, uh, a lot of horrible stuff, and he wrote about it, and very quickly, overnight, it turned into a book, you know, and he was able, because he was a he was an author that had a, a reputation already. That book sold very quickly. A publisher wanted it. And we've got some cadets up at Norwich University in the United States. They're reading that book right now. And that's his, he does an interesting job of blending his personal lived experience with having served in the global war on terror, while also providing like a wider context for for a war that's very controversial, right? It's like providing some political context, some socioeconomical context for this event that's going to shape future generations, right? So cadets right now are going through that book and discussing this very relevant experience. Now, like I said, they're cadets. They didn't serve in that war, but that war is that legacy is hanging right over them, and they have access now to this book, to this author who who's giving his thoughts in almost real time. We're talking to Michael Plunkett, uh, Marine uh, writer, author, um, part of the Startup uh, Core Group of Literature of War Foundation, and it sounds, Michael, that you're not just looking for. Um, the unit, the platoon, the the group of cadets to kill a few hours reading, but you're trying to promote and stimulate conversation, and maybe a deeper thinking by them on some topics. How how do you get that going? Because you're not in the room on a, on a as you would be as a teacher asking those questions on a daily or weekly basis. Yeah, no, that's the challenge, right? Uh, you, like like I said, when we were doing these book drives, it's one thing to pass books off, right? And a couple of units that we did the book drives with were kind of like, listen, we've done this with other foundations before, but we literally got, you know, boxes of used cookbooks and romance novels that nobody wanted to read. That's not good programming, right? So in addition to providing good curated list of books, right, where we're working with the unit to see what they actually need to read, we provide uh, external support as well. So that comes in the form of discussion questions, first and foremost. So you're trying to figure out how do I even talk to these guys about this? How do we even get the ball rolling? Well, we'll give you 10, 20 discussion questions to kind of use as you're going through the through the book to stimulate conversation. You know, I like I said, I taught high school briefly after I first graduated from undergrad. Uh, I realized that people don't all learn the same way. Not everybody's going to sit down and read a book cover to cover and be able to talk eloquently about it or get something out of it. They need other stimuli to kind of push them a little bit in one direction or another. So we will source some podcast episodes, some interviews, maybe, maybe there's a film version of the book and maybe that helps you if you can read and then watch the film, maybe that kind of informs some of your perspective as well. So we provide those support materials as well as once they're finished and we do that debrief session on, on zoom where we sit down and we talk to them, I'm trying to encourage guys to write about their experience. And this way, we, we've got a couple of connections to some some publications that are, you know, uh, geared towards the military community. And 
we want to try and get a couple of people to publish whatever their experience was, whether that's uh, more of like a book report about the book itself, or maybe even just the experience of having sat down and discussed these books uh, with their with their fellow uh, soldiers, sailors, Marines, what have you. Uh, so that's some of the ways we do it. It's, it's an interesting, um, as I say, military book club, if you will. Do you see this springing up from an NCO who says, I need something like this to help pull the guys, get, have them all on a common ground, or is it an officer down kind of thing? Where, where, where does that, fir- where does that first, uh, hey, can we do this? Can you do this for us? Come from? It's it's been it's been kind of scattered. Honestly, we have fifty units that are working through it right now. We're trying. We have successfully funded about twenty of them, uh, and we've got another thirty waiting waiting for funding. Uh, but we've got. When I look at the list of who's requested it, it's everything from your your NCOs to your officers. It's mostly the younger guys, though. We have our like our our, our younger NCOs who have just taken on that billet, who have just taken on that responsibility, uh, to the young lieutenants who are just coming out of academies. They're coming out of training, and they're looking to you know make a good impression on the unit and figure out ways to to motivate the troops. So it's been an interesting kind of spread uh, between rank, at, but definitely more on the younger side. Well, certainly it's like um, they're more likely to say, let's try something different. Right. We don't have to do what we've always done. Let's do something different. So this is a great segue to you got 20 funded, you got 30 waiting. Let's talk to the veteran radio listeners about how um, funding works, what's it cost, maybe how people can help out. Yeah, of course. So if you go to our website, litofwar.com, uh, you'll see that, that we've got some of the units that are looking for funding up. There's uh, ways to you know donate. It's a simple click click a button. And listen, at this point, we're, we're accepting any, any level of donation. What I will say, just to give some clarity around how those funds work, if you are willing to sponsor a platoon, an entire platoon, that's $1,000. Now that takes care of getting the books to them, all shipping and, and, and co- charging costs and all that as well as merchandise that takes care of any incidentals, uh, any hiccups along the way. And it goes to supporting this foundation, keeping our website going, keeping, keeping the whole thing up. We are all volunteer here. So there's no, nobody's taking a, taking a, a cut of any of this money. It goes entirely to the program. Now down from that, if you do uh, about half of that, let's say $500, that's about uh, maybe a squad or two that helps out about half a platoon or so. Uh, down from that, if you go to like 250, you're you're looking at like a fire team, and even if you want to just donate 25 or 50 dollars, that you're you're getting down to the individual marine soldier sailor that that you're supporting, and you can earmark if you if you want to see like, hey, what units are out there, and you want to see like, hey, I want to donate specifically to this to this uh, this particular army unit, this Marine Corps unit, we can earmark that and say, all right, your 25 dollars, we'll we'll put it in the bucket for them, and when they get fully funded, you're 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 part of the support for that specific unit. Uh, this is a great idea. I think it's a great way to get uh, quality literature out to the troops and help them build some commonality by reading the same thing, um, uh, having those support questions to get the conversation started and, and then debrief afterwards. Um, so let's let's give it again, Michael Plunkett, uh, Marine, um, f- co-founder of uh, L- Literature, of War Foundation, what's the website? Litofwar.com. And before we get out of here and run out of time, because this always goes too fast, did I uh, read somewhere you've got a debut novel uh, that that's going to get published maybe next year? I do indeed. Yeah, just uh, just a little while ago we signed a contract. Uh, my debut novel, Zone Rouge, uh, which is a modern reimagining of the Sisyphus myth set in the fields around Verdun. They're over there. It's kind of crazy, but today they are still cleaning up all the ordnance, the unexploded ordnance from World War I. Uh, the French government literally has pays people to go out there and take care of that. And I wrote a novel about, you know, what keeps a person going in a profession where they think it's going to take another couple hundred years before they're able to really clean the land from this war that was fought over a century ago. And it's coming out through unnamed press sometime next year. Well, that's great to hear. We're glad to be able to uh, plug it uh, a year from now, get back to us, and uh, maybe we can have a discussion about that. Uh, what a what a wonderful connection, almost you know, kind of a full circuit, circle thing here from your grandfather, your grandmother, the storyteller, his time in Korea, storytelling in the family and you've you know kind of that's now worked through your life to where you're helping passing along 
the love of storytelling to other troops. Absolutely. Yeah, I, it really is a full circle moment. Michael Plunkett, thank you for taking some time today to talk to Veterans Radio about this uh, really cool operation and, and Literature of War Foundation. Yeah, thanks very much, guys. I really appreciate the support. Thanks for having me on. And I want to thank everybody for listening to Veterans Radio today. I am Jim Fossone. It's been a pleasure to be your host. I'm a veterans disability lawyer at Legal Help for Veterans, and you can reach us at 800 800- 693-4800 or LegalHelpForVeterans.com on the web. You can follow Veterans Radio on Facebook and listen to its podcasts and internet radio shows by visiting us at VeteransRadio.org That's VeteransRadio.org And until next time, you are dismissed. If you have a VA claim denied by the Board of Veterans Appeals, contact Legal Help for Veterans at one 800 693 4800. They're experts in handling cases before the U.S. Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims. Their number again, 1-800-693-4800. We would again want to thank our national sponsors, the National Veterans Business Development Council, nvbdc.org, VA Ann Arbor Health Care System, the Vietnam Veterans of America, Charles S. Kettles Chapter, Ann Arbor, Michigan, VFW Graf O'Hara Post 423 in Ann Arbor, and the American Legion Press Corn Post 46 also in Ann Arbor. We appreciate all your support. You can go to veteransradio.net, click on the sponsor level, and continue to support keeping Veterans Radio on the air. And until next time, you are dismissed. <laughs>